Welcome to Dear SQL DBA, a podcast and YouTube show for SQL Server database administrators and developers. I'm Kendra Little from SQLWorkbooks.com. This episode, I am talking about auto-tuning as well as the number one mindset problem that I have had as a database administrator. I've had a few folks ask me the question, you had an episode in the past, Kendra, where you talked about, will the cloud eat my DBA job? But they say, I'm still concerned. Now that artificial intelligence is the buzzword for everything, and we've got all sorts of self-tuning features in SQL Server, should I really spend my time investing in building my DBA skills, especially as a performance tuner? Or is the SQL Server just going to totally tune itself so that this is wasted time? The reason that this question is coming up is because we have things like the first version of an auto-tuning feature in Query Store, which is quite interesting. You may have been hearing things about auto-tuning from like the SQL Server marketing material since SQL Server 2005. Like we, those of us who've been around for a while have been hearing that, oh, you know, you won't need to hire a DBA anymore. We've been hearing that line for quite a while now and it's never come true. But the fact that that message is around kind of points out that hiring database administrators or developers who focus on performance tuning is expensive right? That's a recurring cost. It doesn't come for free. And these new features can say, okay, we've got query store in SQL Server where we can configure the database to look at different query plans and gather some aggregate statistics to see it, to basically say, okay, sometimes this query is faster and sometimes it's slower. Maybe I can try to pin the faster plan and see if it just gets faster. And there's a lot of cool stuff in that, right? Like the, the idea of, oh, maybe some of these tough problems like parameter sniffing that are really tricky to diagnose. Oh, when the procedure compiles in one way, I get this plan that doesn't work very well. And when it compiles differently, I get a better plan. I'm just going to stick with the fast one without even talking to a person. Hey, that sounds really, really awesome. And that can be great if the faster plan is truly the best plan. I mean, if we think about it, this is a lot like coffee, you know, like you can go to a cafe. I live in Portland, Oregon in the United States, and I can go to a cafe and get a lovingly handcrafted coffee made by a person with a, a very advanced degree who has also studied many different kinds of coffee beans and they're operating a finely crafted machine and they're just making something beautiful for me. And then I can also go to another store where the person presses a button and the coffee is automatically made. And maybe I get the coffee really quickly that's automatically made. And maybe it's even a pretty darn good coffee. Is it still as good as the coffee that is lovingly handcrafted by the highly skilled professional who can make great conversation with me and is really funny while I'm, I'm getting the coffee? No, it's not as good. In some cases, I'm going to just want to take the coffee that's cheaper. Like when cost is the biggest factor, maybe I don't want to interact with a person at all. I just want a good enough coffee. And I think there really is something to that. As this is something that though isn't new. If you think about it, this isn't even specific to auto-tuning. Think about SSDs. Think about the amount of memory we can put in a server now. Think about increases in just CPU power over the last five years. Like there's a lot of things that, I mean, we could have terrible code that's really unoptimized. And there's a lot of ways that with buying just an expensive server that maybe we do have to replace eventually, or maybe, you know, we have to replace it in five years, but it's cheaper than hiring a DBA and paying their salary for all those five years, right? 
and maybe we replace it faster than five years. I'm, it's, it's life cycle through our whole environment maybe is five years. It may not be in production for five years because these changes and improvements in what we can do keep coming faster. But the thing is, over, you know, we've had these massive improvements in hardware that you'd think, oh, maybe we don't need performance tuning anymore, but I don't think it's that our code just keeps getting worse and worse. It's that we want to do more and more stuff. We want to process more and more information. So at the same time that our hardware is getting faster and the SQL Server Optimizer has been getting more and more clever too. And we've been getting all these new features with column store and different ways we can process material. Like all of this stuff is happening. We still, there's more and more people who want to process data in different ways. There's more and more data. Yeah, cost continues to be a factor, but the need to do things, I mean, there's so many complex choices to make out there with hardware, with which technologies to use with what are we, you know, how are we going to deliver the data the fastest? How are we going to lay this out in our environment? And how, how are we going to manage this the most quickly? There's so much architecture work to do that even with advanced auto-tuning, even as this auto-tuning becomes smarter and smarter, whether or not to turn it on, <laughs> and how to design the environment and how to manage this all, there is still a lot of work to do in there and a lot of it has to do with performance. Also, you know, when things go wrong, <laughs> we need a human being to help make it work in, in critical situations. There's more ways that the SQL Server is becoming more intelligent. There's things like adaptive query processing. SQL Server, can now start generating query plans that aren't, I'm just gonna do this one thing. The query plan has some flexibility built into it. Hey, if this join doesn't look like the right join, maybe I can adapt on the second run. But, you know, so one of the things about this feature, there's a similar feature to this that you've been able to buy in Oracle in the past. And, well, I've noticed that there are still Oracle DBAs, right? <laughs> they still seem to have jobs. They still seem to be doing well. And as I think about adaptive query processing and starting to work with it more and more, I think, well, when things do get slow, this is gonna be really interesting to figure out. And then how does this play in with the other auto-tuning features, troubleshooting this? and learning when to deploy this just gets more and more exciting. I don't feel afraid of this. Yeah, it is possible that eventually auto-tuning will get to the point that it takes all of the performance tuning jobs, but I think that happens at a point where like all of the jobs have been taken over by artificial intelligence. Like it's way down the line. It is long, far into the future. And hopefully as a society at that point, we have figured out more about what to do when you have incredibly intelligent technology. But that's not just a problem for the DBAs. That is an interesting futurism problem for everyone, for the foreseeable future in our lifetime, I really think if you're interested in performance tuning, these auto-tuning features are really exciting and they make your job more interesting. If you're moving into this path as a specialist and you want to specialize more and more, this is an area where learning it and learning how you can use it, how you can recognize it, how you can troubleshoot it, how you can configure it. This is a great opportunity because we're just starting to get this and we're at a point that could potentially be really exciting if you build your expertise in this. So rather than fearing that it's gonna take your job, I think it's really a way you could make your job much cooler. Even if your current company isn't using this stuff, 
you can carve out some time in your week and you gotta, you gotta be able to say, I'm gonna carve out some time and really use it each week to have a sandbox and play around with this because even if your company isn't using SQL Server 2017 now, it's absolutely justifiable just if you're on the career path of DBA is saying, I need to understand the new features in the latest release so that when it could help us, when this is a feature that could make a real difference to us, that I can recognize it and help point out things that could maybe make this decision, you know, worth doing. So education is definitely a responsibility for yourself. And don't don't say, okay, just because we have 2008 R2 instances still, I can't learn new stuff. You really can learn new stuff. You can't do it necessarily on that 2008 R2 instance. And when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking back to when I managed SQL 2000 instances, SQL Server 2005 instances back in the day. I was lucky to often get to work in positions where I got to work on the latest and greatest technologies, in some case before they became released, which let me tell you, it has its own, it has its own downsides. <laughs> has cool things too, but uh, it's a double-edged sword. But I also worked with some environments where, you know, we couldn't upgrade them. And I say couldn't, you know, <laughs> for political reasons, mostly, for, for financial reasons. But thinking back to just my history as a DBA, there was really, I really always, I always wanted to learn performance tuning. I always had that desire, but I had a mindset that was super problematic. And, and I built this mindset as part of my job. And if you have this mindset too, it is the number one mindset problem that I would work on altering. As a database administrator, we tend to develop this, this habit of scanning the technical world we live in for problems that may occur. And part of why we do this is just in change planning. What could go wrong is a, a really important thing to think about. Companies' data is often critical to the company's survival. You know, not just a matter of winning or losing a few dollars, but bad things happening can put the company out of business when it comes to the data, right? So we tend to get into this mindset of being a protector and looking for what is going to go wrong. This mindset can be very helpful for planning changes, for saying, okay, how can I mitigate that risk, right? We do need to, in our jobs, identify risk, but the problem is this mindset can put you in a place where you don't see opportunities in new features and where you become just a fearful, I became a person who feared technical change. Is this gonna break my system? Is this gonna break my job? You just become used and habituated to scanning the world for these things. We need to, as DBAs, not only, we do have to look for risks. We do have to protect the data, but we also need to get into a mindset of looking for opportunities and possibilities. Even if we can't always act on those opportunities, even if we aren't going to be able to make these possibilities happen in our workplace, it's very, very helpful for you, for your employer, and it also is honestly more fun to be the person who thinks about the cool things you can do and recognizes them and doesn't feel down just because you can't do them all, but actually just enjoy saying, hey, you know, there's, what if we did this? What would happen then, right? And, and kind of is just interested, sees the opportunities, plays around with stuff, comes up with clever ideas. These are the habits that are going to lead you into that area where you are specializing in the new feature. We're either taking your current company into a technology that you helped them find, or maybe you're finding a different job, either at your current company or at another company where you're doing that too, but you're finding those possibilities and you're moving into them. And this may sound just impossible because I've got 99 changes to deploy and <laughs> they've all got problems and it's Friday at 420, right? Well, 
the way to change this, you can't just suddenly wake up one day and be like, I'm going to be a person who is creative and thinks of possibilities. You can't just sort of rationally decide, hey, I'm going to change my mindset and, you know, it's done. But you can do it. it. You just have to be craftier about it. There are daily habits that you can change to change your mindset. One of the things that I have been doing well, I've been, so I've been doing it for a couple of months, but I've been doing it seriously for about 20 days is I started at the end of the day, uh, just making a list of things that I was grateful for that it, you know, occurred to me for that day. And when I first started, I was just doing five or six things. That's the one that I've been doing for longer. But then more recently, I started getting more serious about it and I have a little booklet and there's maybe 16 or 17 lines per page. So I just spend a little bit more time doing it. It takes me about four minutes a day. And I just write a list of things I'm grateful for. Now this may, this may sound like just sort of like, oh, that's kind of cheesy. It is cheesy, but it works. <laughs> yeah, it's totally cheesy. Here, I didn't even realize why it worked until recently I was watching a, a video recommended that I saw recommended on Twitter by Aaron Stilato. And at the end of this video, they recommend that to make employees happier and more productive, at the beginning of the day, one of the things you do is make a list of things that you're grateful about. And they point out that part of what this does for you is it puts you in a mindset of scanning the world for things that are good. Think about it. This is what we're talking about. Changing your mindset to look for opportunities is very similar and related to this habit of changing your mindset to scan the world and look for things that are that that you're grateful for. And you know, a lot of the things that I'm grateful for are things that are like opportunities and possibilities, things that excite me, things that I'm curious about, as well as things that other people have done too. So changing your mindset, doing a daily habit, where you write down something that you're grateful for, for me at least, for me personally, has really, really helped me to become a person who is more open to possibility, more interested in reaching out to it, and less fearful of change, which as a database administrator, if you are in that mindset too, which is just super easy to get into because we need to protect the data, I think that that one little habit can really change your life for the better. So. I don't think auto-tuning is going to put performance tuners out of business. I do think we're seeing an increasing trend where if you specialize deep, there's so many tools you can work with and it's so complex that there is a lot of room still for that specialist and there is going to be in the future too. Thanks for listening to Dear SQL DBA. I'm Kendra Little from SQLWorkbooks.com and I'll talk to you soon.